Everybody, it is Friday, March the 29th, 2024. It's raining in San Francisco, late March, rather unusual. And it's raining in Palo Alto, at least according to Keith Tier, whose newsletter, whose That Was the Week newsletter on tech, is entitled Data Driven Investing. And he begins his editorial saying, It's Friday morning in Palo Alto. Rain is drizzling down my windows and the weekend will be wet. Sounds very depressing, Keith. <laughs> well, except if you're English, you actually like the sound of rain. Don't you, Andrew? Well, I, I actually rather enjoy it. I like the fact that it upsets other people. Um, <laughs> how, how, how has it influenced, though, uh, your editorial on data investing? I'm always, I have to admit, I'm always a bit skeptical of this concept of data investing i mean it's, it's a truism you only invest when you have the data so what's the big deal about it well well there's all kinds of data so if you of course every single investor who makes an investment um there's two things you need to know about them one is they have a goal in mind and secondly they have some kind of data that supports their decision so data is is everywhere but that use of the word data is usually reduced down to what venture capitalists call due diligence. So they, they might get the company's finances, they might do background checks on the founders, they might do some market analysis to decide whether that company is in a high growth industry where the upside is unlimited. That is data. But what this uh, week's stories uh, that people have written and that's why the title's there there's a lot of content this week written by and people. i have to i have to say keith i mean for people watching the your ai artist is getting worse it looks like a sort of a swirl of different colors almost a uh a, a, a nightmarish ice cream cone where do you get this imagery from so i uh, so you know what happened is i asked chat gpt uh, for, I, I gave it my editorial, but I pressed enter before it got the editorial, and all it got from me was give me uh, um, grays and reds, uh, yes. shades of gray and red. I don't think Chat GPT is ever going to become Rembrandt. Anyway, so so we've got terrible art, we've got miserable weather in Palo Alto of all places in late March, and we have data investing. What, what What's happening this week on the data investing front. I know you were quite influenced by an interesting piece from our friend Mike Butcher at TechCrunch about data finding that unicorn founders are underdogs, quote unquote, and that female founders are rising. What's interesting about that data? 
Well, the first is um, most of most of the people who believe in data driven investing uh, have this assumption that founders uh, can be scored based on where they went to school. Uh, and that the likelihood of outcomes, for example, Ilya, who's a professor at Stanford, has a whole thesis about where founders went to school correlated to unicorn production. And what this study that Mike Butcher is writing about says is that um, uh, the, the strongest signal is that they're underdogs. And by underdogs, he means not white males that are American by birth. Uh, he says there's lots of immigrants, there's lots of brown and black skinned people and this was a defiance report yeah um, from a company a, a research company defiance capital i have to admit again a little bit of skepticism you include yourself in that because you're an immigrant but you're hardly an underdog certainly in the united states well, I, I and you can... came here as a successful entrepreneur there's no underdog quality to that andrew if, if i took you to eastfield estate in scarborough uh, yeah, but that's I, another issue. The, the, I mean, I'm the, definitely not. I definitely wasn't rated to be a success. Well, okay. Well, let me include myself then. If I, as an entrepreneur, although I'm a serially, uh, serially failed entrepreneur, I would be included as an underdog here because I'm an immigrant to the U.S. and there's yeah. uh, there's nothing about me that's the underdog. Uh, you know, I I I I beg to differ. I think I think. A, a lad from the Jewish North London district uh, is not necessarily an overdog. You had to struggle somehow or other to get where you are in life. My struggle, oi, no, that's <laughs> yeah, the, the point is, is that these, the, these categories are a little vague. So, well, well, well that, that in a way is my point, Andrew. The, the, the vagueness of the categories means that it's super hard to use data intelligence to find them. And that's why I put it in. Uh, Mike, in a way, is saying, look, the facts are so weird that actually you couldn't discover these winners by doing data-driven work prior to them being winners. You, you wouldn't have been able to find them. So I put it there because it puts a question mark over how realistic data-driven discovery is. Um, and, and so I thought yeah, it was- and good... isn't it sort of, you know, the thing with these, knowing uh, the Ilya uh, research at Stanford, I mean, everybody knows that a lot of VCs invest in Stanford or Harvard grads. So that's a no brainer. It, it is, but it doesn't correlate to success in the way they think it does. Um, I mean, there is some correlation, obviously. There are some minority number of big winners went to good schools like Stanford. So there's obviously some correlation. But the, re the real question is, is it better than what you would do by, you know, randomly making decisions based on companies you meet? And, and the answer is no, it isn't. That, that's why the other article about um, the S&P 500 is so so important. Right, and that was an interesting piece on the S&P 500. You shows that if between 2010 and 2020, had you invested $100,000, uh, S&P 500 return would have been 364K and hedge funds would have been 160K. What about VCs? Uh, where, where's the VC element here? Well, the, the, the average VC would have been done far worse than both of these. Um, the top you know, 5% would have been as good as the hedge funds. So that tells us that it's not wise to, 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 to back startups or to try to become an investor. You're just better off putting your money in the stock market. Uh, no, it doesn't actually say that. It, it, it says that you, if you are going to put money in the stock market, you're most likely to do better if you put it into an index. That's probably the anchor point that I, I believe that's true. Well, um, most people put it in indexes because it's easier and simpler. And safer. So now in venture capital, there is no such thing as an index. You can't put your money in an index. So if you're going to do venture capital at all, um, you are stock picking in the way that the hedge funds do. So you're go mostly going to underperform the average when you do that. 
and and uh, th therein lies why the rest of the articles in this AI section this week are interesting, because they're all people trying to beat the average using data. And, uh, and which and is hope... always the case with investing, isn't it? I mean, isn't you know if you can beat the average by 0.1 percent, then then you become very rich, and if you don't, you lose all your money. Well, that's always the goal, but um, what's happening now is that being successful is becoming possible. So, so in the past, that goal was hardly ever met. But the point of the editorial and the stories is we're now getting to a point where, where uh, a data-driven approach is showing real value. Um, well, you would say that, Keith, because of uh, signal rank. I mean, that's what you do. So... Yeah, but even though I would say that, you've got to challenge me uh, about whether it's true. And if, if 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 I would say that and it's true, which I think it is, then um, then it, that's quite. Well, important. going back to, I mean, as a, as a um, in a simple sense, I mean, if if you're putting your money into the S and P five hundred in an index fund through your your broker and go to Merrill Lynch or many other places to do that. Um, wh why try to beat the market in a more sophisticated way in, 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 in what you're trying to do at signal rank? Well, let, let's start with the fact that there is an asset class called venture capital, and it, it is their job to invest money and return more than they invested. So it doesn't really matter what I would do personally, but what we're assessing here is whether the venture asset class can be improved using data. And, and, and of course, it, it should want the answer to be yes, um, if, if it's possible, because that's the job of the people in venture capital. Their job is to turn money into more money and return it and then do it again. So that beg, that tees up the question very well. Uh, Andre Retorath is in this week's uh, newsletter a lot. He's uh, uh, based in Germany and is... He runs Data Driven VC newsletter, and he runs a VC fund called Early Bird. He, he's on the record for a long time uh, talking about how to find what venture capitalists call alpha. And alpha is you know, the very best outcomes, using data as a filter in the selection process. So he, he's in there. Now, I don't think there's any evidence yet that he has been able to succeed at doing that. Um, he's a strong advocate of it, but I ha and, and I may be wrong. I haven't seen his outcome numbers, um, uh, so I'm not sure he can do it. But it felt to me like this was a perfect moment for me to disclose the work I've been working on this week, which is building the next version of Signal Rank, where I think we do do it. We actually deliver on the promise. And um, so Andre and two or three other writers, plus Signal Rank, are in are in the newsletter to compare and contrast approaches and likelihood of success. Well, the other news, Keith, this week is that Sam Bankman fried got sentenced to 25 years in prison. He used to promise that he knew how to beat the system. I'm not suggesting you're the next Sam Bankman fried but what does this story tell us about promises of guys like uh, SBF that they know how to beat the system? Well, I... I you know, I think it's fair to say his promises turned out to be true. What, what he was accused of was illegality when things went bad. But now that we're, you know, a year or more past those events, it turns out that the investors in FTX are going to get their money back and then some because the market in Bitcoin and other derivatives came back. Um, but he still committed the crimes he committed, you know, in his attempt to either cover up or save um, a bad outcome. A few so, months ago, we had the SPF conversation. I said to you, the guy's obviously guilty and he deserves to go to jail. And you said, well, he hasn't been tried yet. Let's wait to see what happens. Would you acknowledge that he he's guilty and deserved a, a long prison term? I he certainly I would acknowledge that he's guilty and he, he had his moment to prove he wasn't and fail. So clearly he's guilty. Um, but I think what he's guilty of is um, really bad judgment correlated to um, something less bad, which was an attempt to save a sinking ship. 
Um, so the 25 years, if you compare that to the 110 years, which would, be, would have been the maximum sentence, but a lot more than the five years that would have been the minimum, you know, one imagines that the judge uh, strongly felt that the guilt was stronger than... Uh, I mean, what's your take on the argument that he was trying to do good and that he was funneling some of the money to altru uh, effective altruism um, and that he certainly was no Bernie Madoff buying, uh, buying jewels and cars and real estate. To, to No, he, he definitely is not a Bernie Madoff. He, he's more of it a... Isn't saying much. He's on the spectrum, I would imagine, and uh, from what I see. And I think he was, I think he thinks he was trying to make things better. I don't think he was thinking, I'm going to steal this money for myself. So, uh, you know, his awareness of the law and the lines he crossed seems to have been extremely poor in doing that. And so he made some judgments that were illegal. And he's been found guilty for that. But if, if you're his parents who are distraught, um, I think it I think you would think of him as, you know, a, a kind of a, a challenged good person as opposed to a bad person. Well, there's an element culturally also of farce here where both parents teach at Stanford Law School. They teach tax law. They must have known that he was skirting the law, if not breaking it. Some people have accused them of being involved in this. Has the SBF, you're in Palo Alto, even if it's raining today, Keith, has this had any impact on how people think about their supposedly brilliant children and their startup um, endeavors? I think the answer is no. I mean, I, it's interesting. I have a friend who's in um, another part of the world who resigned from a very top financial institution this week in order to pursue a career that is in the crypto space. And this person is a very stable, smart, intelligent person who uh, believes that um, his income, which is constrained in his current job, uh, will become unconstrained as he makes this move. So crypto still is a trap. Is that your warning to this unnamed fellow that he should uh, he should be a little bit more realistic? I think he's figured that out. I think he you know he's he's grown up, so he'll make his own moves. But he does have children and a family, and he's taking a lot of risk. And crypto therefore still can do that. It can still attract talent, uh, and that's because the promise of you know, the upside is still very strong, as it is with data, by the way. In other news of the week, leaving aside SBF, um, some interesting stuff, Keith, about Apple. Uh, a couple of, two, three pieces on Apple in, in, in the, that was the week newsletter. Um, two in particular that I, I was intrigued by, the uh, about the EU share of Apple's global revenue and whether or not Apple might simply say to the EU, it's not worth it. We're going to just leave the market. It's only 10% of the market. Um, is that conceivable that Apple would just shut the door on Europe, on, e on the EU at least? Well, so it, it's 7% of their global revenues. Um, not, not Europe, the EU is 7% of their global revenues. And if, if, if the EU is fining them more than 7% of their global revenues, which it is, then pure economics will say, let's not be in the EU, which would deny EU citizens access to Apple hardware and software unless they buy it outside. So I, I don't think it's a crazy idea that they could do that. Um, uh, MG Siegler engaged with that story in one of the other articles, and he definitely gives it some credibility, as does Daring Fireball. Uh, the the, uh, the Gruber, uh, but they're particularly Gruber is doing it from. He seems to always be in Apple's pocket, one way or the other. I mean, I, I it would be a very dramatic move. It would it would involve them shutting down all their stores. You wouldn't be able to have an iPhone in Europe. You wouldn't be able to own a Mac. How, how would this work? Well, but I 
the real story here probably is how irrational the EU is when it comes to innovation and technology. And, and I think this would probably end up being true for Google and lots of other companies. I, I doubt it's just an Apple thing. The, the EU is, has taken on the mantle of fighting big tech to preserve uh, the interests of its citizens. And what these articles expose is that there's a contradiction at the heart of that because the EU isn't important enough for the fines it's wielding. The, the fines it's wielding, by the way, are enormous because they fine companies based on their global revenue and they find them a percentage of their global revenue, even though the EU is just the EU. So the EU, the audacity of the EU in, in uh, taking on big tech is very likely to backfire one way or another, whether it means Apple won't be in Europe, I think is, is a detail that doesn't really detract from the irrationality of the EU in, 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 in how it's proceeding. Um, and of course, our own FTC and DOJ seem to love the EU approach and are doing their very best in a very different way because they, they, they're more savvy about what is legal and what isn't legal. Uh, they're not attacking these companies for the same things the EU is, uh, but they are attacking them. And so what would you say to people who see the EU as the only uh, series of states actually standing up to big tech? You think that's not true? Well, it is true. The real question is, is it smart? And is it, it smart in, does it, does in, it in business terms or in ethical terms? Does it serve the citizens uh, of Europe? in any way at all. Like the fact that Apple has to drop the lightning connector in favor of a USB-C. Who really cares? I mean, yeah, I, no one cares about that. But I was thinking if, um, I mean, it's still very, very hard to imagine. It would be a massive, massive development. But let's say Apple or Google or Amazon pulled out of, of the EU. That would offer enormous opportunities for EU entrepreneurs, wouldn't it? I doubt, I doubt that because they'd have to come up. If they could do something better than Apple, they already would be. Uh, you know, the most That's not the point. I mean, if, if Apple's not there, then, then, then it gives them an opportunity to sell phones or app stores or... Yeah, they'll, they'll sell Android. Services. But I guarantee those European citizens who are able to will still buy iPhones. They just won't buy them in the EU. They'll pay more because the iPhone's better. They want it. So it become like the old Soviet Union. People be smuggling in jeans, but rather than jeans, it's iPhones. It is like the Soviet Union. I mean, it's a... What, the it, EU? What, the when was the last time you went there? The EU government, from a regulatory point of view, let's be specific, I'm not making broad statements here, but from a regulatory point of view, it's a top-down bureaucracy acting without any mandate from its citizens. You're saying that the, e, the, 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 the government of the EU... The government of the EU the is, uh, is the, the is equivalent to the Soviet Union. Well, it's a it's a it's a centralized authority taking decisions. You're beginning to sound like Mrs. Thatcher, Keith. I don't know about or, that. Or some of the other Brexit people. So, are you suggesting that it was wise for the British to pull out? I empathise with those Brits who felt the EU was some kind of an overlord. I do. I do. I do. Do not empathise with the nationalistic. Uh, uh, lobby that was part of Brexit, but the the part that believes that EU is a, kind of a top down overlord making decisions that it really has no democratic mandate for that I agree with. Do you think that Apple, though, even I mean I understand the point. Well, maybe it's not worth it economically for us to be in Europe, but it's more than just economics. There's the value of having beautiful Apple stores in London and Paris and Rome. So. It's hard to imagine, even in the worst case scenario, that Apple would, would simply pack its bags and, and leave the EU, isn't it? Well, remember, Tim Cook started life as a CFO. And if, if you're earning 7%, but they're fining you 10%, you know, you're paying to be in Europe. You're not making a cent. You're paying to be in Europe. And instead of them taxing you, they're fining you to get to get at, at your global revenues. I don't know that you can sustain that. Your shareholders actually should be angry with you if you do, uh, because you're 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 getting zero out of it. 
Um, and I think the lesson here is the EU has got to become a little bit more smart about its fine scale. Well, I don't think the EU would be particularly concerned. I think, if anything, they might consider it a victory. So this reflects a broader splinter net. Last week, or a couple of weeks ago, we talked about TikTok and the US attempt to nationalize TikTok and uh, a Cold War, economic Cold War, tech Cold War with China. Are we seeing then? A book was written a few years ago called Splinter Net. A lot of people have always warned about this. Are we seeing the long-term fragmentation of the internet? I mean, we already know that there's a Russian internet, an Iranian internet, a Chinese internet. Is there about to become a European internet as well? That That is the obvious consequence of everything that's going on, you know, which would, I believe, be a terrible outcome for humanity. But that is the trend. The trend is for governments to try to police and control um, the digital presence in the, inside their borders uh, with, with a set of rules that um, uh, the companies have to abide by. And, and that goes for mergers and acquisitions, as well as it does for rules, uh, as well as it does for privacy. I mean, it's, it's really everything. So if, if you're an executive at a big tech firm in, in 2024, your life is significantly harder than it was you know, in, in 1994 when the internet first started, when authorities were you know, not really a consideration. Um, no wonder it's raining in Palo Alto, Keith. <laughs> yeah. I think... And what would this mean? I mean, this is a very speculative idea. I am still enormously skeptical that we'll even get close to this. But what would it mean to these global US tech leviathans like Apple and Google and Facebook and Amazon uh, if if the internet splinters and then their main markets are really just left in the U.S. Well, the the U.S. is is um, you know based measured by human beings, it's a fairly small percentage of the global market. Measured by money spent, it's a very big proportion. Asia collectively is uh, bigger now than the U.S. Uh, on both counts. And, and so if you were to think, of, uh, you know, the question was, what are the most important markets for big tech? I think the UK is still one. Uh, outside of US and UK and Asia, India is a rising uh, one, if you don't include that within Asia. Um, and, you know, for Apple, at least China is huge. Uh, it, uh, so I, I, I think Europe, by which I mean the EU, is is somewhat unimportant in the big picture um and that's just just an economic reality and I, I you know that said every government is copying what the eu is doing because governments in, in a way they that you know they like rules and bureaucracy because that's what gives them their authority and their power so there's a natural inclination if you are a politician and a government to emulate the EU. And I do think that's happened in India, for example, with TikTok. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult, a, diff a very, very difficult navigation if you're an executive of big, big tech. And it's one of the reasons I believe that um, citizens using these technologies, they're kind of creating a bottoms up globalization that doesn't really have anything to do with these top-down government bureaucracies. And I think ultimately users will have the power to force the politicians to keep their hands off the tools that well, they have. Well, there we have, and, and we have, this is not an issue this week, but we've talked about it in the past. We will in the future about initiatives to take smartphones and social media out of the hands of kids, not just in Europe, but in the US. What about AI? Is that going to change anything? One interesting piece of AI news this week is that uh, Amazon is doubling down on its investment in, in, in Anthropic, one of the, the most independent of credible AI platforms, completing a, a $4 billion investment. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, 
one uh, open uh, one uh, AI company that now has been incorporated into Microsoft. Um, is AI changing this? How will that work? Well, a AI again is American centric. So if you're sitting in Europe where the rules are such that any half intelligent entrepreneur leaves and comes to America, um, you're faced again in this next generation of technology with an American centric innovation world where most of the money is going to flow to the innovators. And, and so, uh, you know, Europe was the first to regulate AI. It just passed an act uh, at the EU level about AI, which is effectively going to exclude Europe as being a reasonable uh, place to build an AI company. Mistral is an exception. It's a French company, Mistral AI. So I, I, I think AI is just another example of global technology, largely centered here in the States, uh, having to navigate governments in the rest of the world. And what about the Amazon news? Does it speak, and I've written about this, we talked about it, about this really not being, the, this new AI boom isn't really a startup boom, it's a, a boom of top-down companies, highly, highly capitalized companies. Um, does this reflect that, the fact that Anthropic now, I mean, how many players are there in the AI market in these broad platforms? There's Anthropic, there's OpenAI, there's Gemini, there's, I guess, Microsoft, although they're heavily invested in these other companies. There aren't any real startups. Well, they're, ultimately, they're all startups because the truth is, just like with mobile and with the cloud, the big companies are late to the game. Um, Google won the search wars because, as a startup because no one else was paying attention. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, smartphone um, turned Apple from a company that was borrowing money from Bill Gates into one that was bigger than Microsoft. So, uh, you know, Apple was almost bankrupt when it got that investment from Bill Gates. So the truth is pretty much every generation of transformation is fueled by startups. What you're in the past, but the point is, this it's all very well going back to Google, and you're right, of course, about that. But there isn't a Google in this AI. Market. Well, yeah, there is. It's OpenAI, and 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 OpenAI was uh, a two-person startup originally. Um, if you go back to 2015, and and so the truth is that nobody believed it was possible to do anything close to what OpenAI launched last year until they launched it. And I don't know if you remember the gasping that went on with chat GPT for version one. Yeah, it's interesting about, I mean, we, we can talk about this another time, but it's interesting with OpenAI that um, the reason they were successful is they took a, a Google white paper and developed it. So yeah, now where in you're the right. same way, I guess, I'm sure Google originally borrowed ideas and white papers from Microsoft. Yeah, where you're right, and by the way, that speaks to the importance of open intellectual debate, publishing, learning from each other. Um, it's, you know, the world can't really innovate without knowledge. And so that cross knowledge is super important. Where I'm going to agree with you is the price of entry to AI is now too high for startups. Um, the, uh, Sequoia Capital this week did this offsite. My video of the week is from it. And it had many of the founders of these companies speaking. And um, they talked a lot about what comes next. Um, it, it's about four hours worth of material all on YouTube. And I strongly recommend anyone interested in AI go and look at it. But Andrew Ng, who, uh, who is in the video of the week this week, is probably the most prescient, um, spoke at length about the next stage. Now, the next stage is multiple AIs being used by users against and for each other. And he talks about how you know you could use Anthropic and give it outputs from ChatGPT and it will improve on them and vice versa. You can even um, do self-referential. So you can go to ChatGPT and get an answer. You can give it its answer back immediately and say, can you improve on this? And it will. 
So the next stage is, is um, when AIs talk to AIs. We've always had the promise the next stage it'll get more democratic. We will see, no doubt. But there still are real startups. One of them is Keith's startup of the week, a genuine startup, a small two-man shop that is building or began as a, two, a small two-man shop like Google, I guess, building an all-electric intercity bus network in the UK, Ember. What is it about Ember that caught your fancy, Keith? The entrepreneurialism of the founders. I mean, you know, you, would, you, you wouldn't think that buying buses was a good startup idea because they're expensive. In this case, by the way, these buses are manufactured in China. They're less expensive than any equivalent they could find, and they're super high quality buses. And um, they're all electric. They can travel around 300 kilometers on a single charge. So it's city to city. The UK is a fairly small uh, landmass. So you can get most places on a single charge on a bus. Um, and they, they've started between uh, uh, two U, uh, uh, Scottish cities. They now have 34 buses in the is, is it a B2C company? Do they yeah. offer, is there a brand called Ember? You can buy yeah. a bus ticket. Yeah, you buy a bus ticket. And it's got modern technology. Like uh, you can know where the bus is at any minute using uh, your phone. So it's got Uber-like characteristics in software. Um, and who are they competing with? This is an old market. I assume it's an ideal opportunity for disruptive startups. It, it, they're competing with large old-fashioned bus companies. Large. Yeah, I can imagine. So it's it's Uber yeah. in a sense all over again. Yeah, exactly. And is it a big market? I mean, what what's the market? I think it's a big market in places where cities are close together, which is most of Europe. Um, so I think it can be a pretty huge market, yeah. And what about the idea of a, a an electric, all electric intercity bus network in the in the US? I don't know anyone. In, when was the last time you went to a bus station, intercity bus station in America, Keith? They're very depressing places. Yeah, well, you know the the Forty Second Street New York Manhattan bus station comes to mind, which I'm very familiar with. But there's uh, there's others. I, you know, I think American cities are too far apart. So until battery technology can take you roughly 600 miles, maybe 700, which it will, it, it, that's coming, um, then it's a little bit harder to imagine uh, wanting to stop for two or three hours to recharge. Yeah, and does Ember have recharging uh, networks? It just uses standard recharging networks that anyone could use. So if you're going from... I don't know, Glasgow to the north, you have to stop to recharge the bus? Not, not in the UK, because there's there aren't that many cities that are further apart than 300 miles. Interesting. Well, we'll keep our eyes on that. Finally, X of the week. It's not Elon Musk. Nothing to do with it. Elon Musk. It's the acquisition of Affinity by Canva. Tell us about this and why, again, it's a... In a sense, it's another startup of the week. Yeah, I cheated. I was I wanted to make it startup of the week as well. Affinity is basically Adobe Photoshop and um, and uh, design tools, photo tools, and also Adobe um, Illustrator, which is a vector graphics tool. Uh, it's a British company that's built very very high quality equivalents to those three pieces of software, and. Um, uh, Canva is kind of like Figma that Adobe just failed to acquire mm. uh, due to regulations. So this is Canva, a startup acquiring Adobe-like characteristics to uh, to compete with Adobe. Yeah, I, uh, uh, the, the, a lot of the press was about this. Uh, we described that Ars Technica described it as a non-subscription-based weapon against Adobe. Is it a large market? You know, I I pay um, a, I paid a one time fee of I think it was three hundred dollars to buy the Affinity software about three years ago. All three ninety nine dollars per software piece. Um, uh, I use it because it's good, and and um, I don't have to pay a subscription fee. So now every three or four years they create a whole new version and they make me pay the ninety nine dollars again. 
So you do, you, they do get your money more than once, but it's several years apart. Do you think Adobe is vulnerable on, on this front, not just in, in photo apps, but in video as well? I think what Adobe, uh, I think of Adobe as an old fashioned company uh, owning software that is going to go out of fashion at some point or uh, be commoditized in the way that Affinity is commoditizing. So, you know, DaVinci Resolve is also better, already better than Adobe Premiere for video, um, as is Final Cut Pro, I think. So, th almost every single piece of software Adobe owns is being commoditized or cloudified by Figma, Canva, and others. So, I don't see long run how Adobe survives unless it does what Microsoft has done successfully, which is transition to a different kind of company with different kinds of software. In the case of Microsoft, it's Azure, the cloud, business intelligence software, stuff that is really good and scales, that makes it compete with Amazon and Google and others. Um, so you're not, um, you're, you're not uh, particularly optimistic on Adobe. Interesting. And, and finally, Keith, both Ember, your startup of the week, uh, Scottish-based company, and uh, Affinity, they're British companies. Of course, you and I are British, so you have a particular knowledge of the British startup marketplace. You railed against the EU. Is post-Brexit Britain, is it a more innovative place? Would you have had Ember and Affinity uh, in the UK if, if, if it was still part of the EU? That's a hard question. I mean, the, 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 all my questions, I, I, I will say, I ask them. you know, ultimately I'll, I would come down to, um, two people more than 10 years ago in the UK, Reshma Sahoni and Saul Klein, who set themselves the task with seed camp of turning London into something that's a bit more close to Silicon Valley in terms of business practice. They've been quite successful. Uh, and catalyzed a whole set of developments that lead to these two companies um, and many others uh, even existing. So I, I think the credit goes to people like that. The, the government self-consciously seems to want to encourage that in the UK now, um, uh, certainly not get in the way of it. And, uh, you know, that's very strong in fintech where the UK has uh, sandboxes which are basically software environments where, for example, banks or insurance companies are forced to make the interfaces available to developers to build new stuff that competes with them. So the UK does have a kind of a more open, competitive feel to it. And certainly if um, in this dramatic worst case scenario, the big US tech companies decided to leave the EU, it would be a wonderful business opportunity for the UK. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was a week. No time to be meek. The goal is to seek the next big thing. Opinions flowing, speaking our truth. 